Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind One Moment at a Time. I'm Howard Blumenfeld and I'm the author of this book. Today I'm going to be talking about early childhood identity development, which starts off the seventh chapter of my book and final chapter, which is called No Identity. Today we're going to talk about part one in early childhood identity development theories. So if somebody were to ask the question, who are you? That's a pretty tough question to answer. You could answer that in any number of ways. You could answer it superficially and discuss your race, your nationality, your sexual orientation, gender, any of those things, those could form part of your identity. But what I'm interested in talking about today is when identity forms at a very young age and exactly how that happens. And so there are some pretty famous psychological researchers, and I'm not gonna discuss all of them, but we'll discuss the main ones, that studied childhood identity development. And the first of those is Jean Piaget, who was a Swiss researcher, and he was responsible for developing the four stages of identity development for early childhood. He, he believed, as did many of these um, researchers back then, that childhood identity development could be broken down or regimented into these different stages, and that every child follows these stages in exactly the same way. Now, with modern identity research, we know that is not really the case entirely, but nonetheless, there's some really great ideas here. So I want to start out with Piaget's ideas. His first um, idea was the idea of genetic epistemology, and he believed that children were like these little scientists, and that they would learn things in four graduated stages, all the way from the newborn stage through adolescence. So I want to talk to you about each of those stages. The first stage is called the sensory motor stage, and this stage is thought to occur between birth and around two years old. And so Piaget believed that children in this stage operated strictly on their senses and absorbed information kind of like a sponge, taking things in through their five senses. So sucking, grasping, looking, reaching, anything tactile. This is how children at that age make sense out of the world around them. One of the critical milestones in this stage, besides children learning basic language and communication skills, that start to develop as they get closer to two years old, but can occur as early as one or around then, is the idea of object permanence. So babies don't have this. So between the ages of you know infancy all the way up to anywhere between three and six months old, there's a little bit of disagreement on exactly when, children who are shown an object and then the object is removed will literally think the object is gone. So sometime in that first stage, in that sensory motor stage, children realize that that object actually didn't go anywhere. And they develop, along with, with their memory development, right? So as long when they develop memories, they know that when that object has gone away, they remember it and they can basically say that that object is still there. That is a critical marker for them progressing into the next stage of development. Object permanence is a necessary skill in order for children to develop mental representations of objects, which leads into the pre-operational stage which occurs between the ages of two and seven. And during this stage, this is where children begin to articulate their thoughts in like a written form. They, they begin to symbolize some of the ideas in the earlier stage and be able to, you know, ex explain them in a real basic way. However, children at this age are thought by PIJ to not be very empathetic and to struggle with any perspectives outside of their own. And they're also thought to not really be able to understand quantity comparisons very well and arithmetic operations and so a classical example is if a, a, you know, a teacher were to take a can of Play-Doh and then Play-Doh out and divide it into, into two equal pieces but one of those pieces they make it look a little bit bigger than the other one and so the thought is that the child would take the one that looks bigger not realizing that they're the same size so that is one of the hallmarks of this pre-operational stage. So the stage where children really start to improve in their critical thinking skills is the concrete operational stage. And this occurs between the ages of seven and 12 years old traditionally. And this is where children are much more able to engage in basic logical reasoning skills. They're able to add things, subtract things, divide, multiply, that kind of stuff. Reason with quantities. No, they would no longer have the same issue they have with the Play-Doh. Play -Doh. And they're able to engage, and they're able to also have some basic reading comprehension. So they also have an understanding of representational equality. So, you know, if they had two glasses of water that were shaped a little bit differently, they would be able to understand how the water poured into those two glasses might actually be the same amount. 
One of the things that children are not able to do very well in the concrete operational stage is abstract reasoning. They can reason with very concrete things, like if you put some blocks in front of them and ask them to add or subtract them, they'd be able to do that. So when that is thought to develop, at least by Piaget, is at age 12 and up, and this is, thought, and this is the final stage of his development, and it's called the formal operational stage. And so this is where students can engage in abstract reasoning and more formal kind of reasoning using logical systems and axiomatic systems. This is the age where Piaget believed that children's brains were really fully developed and they could start to apply the, the kind of logical reasoning that they need to do to solve real world problems. So as part of his basic theories of childhood development, Piaget used some terminology to explain how children acquire knowledge. And so the most fundamental building block of knowledge acquisition for him was called the schema. Schema is a category of knowledge that is adaptable and flexible. So for instance, if a child saw a cat for the first time and it was a black cat, they might think all cats are black, but the moment that they see another cat that might be gray or orange, then they're able to see that that's still a cat. It's just a different colored cat and this other kind of cat exists in their schema gets adjusted accordingly. Closely related to schemas is a concept of assimilation. And this is where a child's able to see another animal that maybe they're out at the park and they see a cat, they've seen many cats before, and they're able to identify that as a cat. So they assimilate that within their schemas. This is really similar, if, you, if we kind of go full circle to the beginning of this book, to um, object recognition and object identification. So Piaget is trying to kind of call out the tools with what he believed students or young students or young scientists, children used to identify objects around the world. The process of accommodation occurs when children form completely new schemas based off of novel objects they've never seen before and they need to identify these accordingly. So, for instance, a child may have seen cats, but they may have never seen a lion, and they see a lion. Their brain has to take in all that information and accommodate it to develop a new schema. The process of balancing out assimilation and accommodation is called equilibration. So equilibration is just that delicate balancing act between taking existing schemas and fitting objects into them and creating entirely new ones. Piaget believed that the acquisition of knowledge was not a passive process, and you know that's a pretty good idea that he had back in that back then. I mean, I think we could still agree with that nowadays. Knowledge acquisition is not passive; it's active and it's fluid, and it changes as children get older. They're able to further construct more complicated concepts around what they see and see things not only in a concrete way, but also to abstract and form new creative ideas. And so Piaget's framework does allow for that. So that's it for today. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind One Moment at a Time. We'll come back again with part two next week, talking about some other early childhood development theories, including Vygotsky and Galperin, two more people that are considered kind of the patriarchal figures of early childhood development. And then after that, we'll do a part three the following week, where we take a more critical analysis of these theories that uh, are not really thought of often or taught in developmental psychology classes, but um, just we're going to look at a lady by the name of Rita DeVries and her reflections on some of these theories. So that'll be coming in a part three. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment below. And when you subscribe, click on ring the bell to be notified of future videos. Also be sure to check me out on Instagram. My username is right here. And I also have a link to my Instagram and other socials inside of my bio. So thank you so much. I hope everybody has a great day.